Well, good evening to everyone. Allow me just a second to adjust my voluminous notes. Well, uh, I've been asked this quarter to teach a class on the minor prophets, as my title slide will convey. And uh, I was a little bit uncertain about PowerPoint, but I teach art history at Harding. If you don't know me, I'm Steve Choate. I'm a quiet guy. You might be a bit surprised, some of you, to hear me talk as much tonight as I will, because normally I don't say a lot. I'm very introverted. But in any case, uh, I am going to do my very best to give you a sense of what the Minor Prophets are about, and uh, I'll share more about that in just a moment. But first, allow me, allow me this. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm feeling the moment. <laughs> I've, I've taught almost for, I'm thinking back to my graduate assistant days of teaching at the University of Mississippi, almost for 30 years. And uh, more than that, I'm the son of a missionary, J.C. Choate. I've heard many speakers and preachers and teachers say with wholehearted fervor, I've looked forward to this moment. I've never said that. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but I think the fact that I was habitually frightened of public speaking when I was a young man, such that I never dreamed I could follow in my father's footsteps, that was not an option for me. I was that kid in junior high who just melted down in fear and trembling to the glee of all of their classmates. And uh, I've gotten over that with God's help. I actually teach for a living, which amazes me, just phenomenal amazement. This is my life. And uh, I've been teaching Bible classes, and on occasion I've been asked to preach. I'm always honored and flattered. I, I want to be clear on that. I'm sincerely honored to be asked but as time goes by and I'm preparing my materials and thinking about the actual thing, that worm of doubt creeps in. And then we get a little closer, and then it gets to be a day or two before, and then it's really serious. And then it gets the day of, and I can manage to maintain composure, but I don't look forward to it. It's a trial that has to be endured, and hopefully I'm successful in delivering my message but the important thing is getting through it. I have really looked forward to this. I, I've been told about it, and so I've been working for about a month on this series of lessons, and I have been in, inside rubbing my hands at how rich the material is and how much I'm excited about sharing it. And for the first time in my life, I'm almost 60, I, I truly can say I've been looking forward to this moment. So I guess I've arrived. <laughs> I guess I'm finally mature as a public speaker. I'm taking up my time. And uh, if you've been in my classes before, and some of you have, then you know time is an enemy for me because I always have more to say than I want to, or rather than I have the time to say, in spite of everything that I've said. So let me be clear here. I have until 8.30 tonight, right? Is that, is that right? Well, honestly, again, I'm exposing some weakness. I'm being very vulnerable here. I've taught for a while, but I don't know how long this is going to take tonight. We might be done within 20 minutes. I've never had that happen. I've gone over a lot of times, but I've never finished that early. I don't know. Tonight might be another first. We'll see. But in any case... Uh, I welcome you. I look forward to this. This is going to be longer than your average quarter because I'm supposed to go through May. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I truly, truly am. So before we begin, I would like to uh, ask uh, God to bless us in this course of study. So if you would bow your heads, please. 
Thank you, Father, for this day, and uh, it's so exciting to begin a new study. We've been doing that at Harding, and uh, tonight we're doing that here at Westside, my spiritual family, my spiritual home. And I pray that you will bless me with uh, the necessary ability to articulate clearly the material that I prepared. I pray that you would bless me in such a way that I can encourage, exhort, uh, those people who are uh, here and uh, who will be present throughout this course of studies. Most importantly, I pray that you would put the truth and true word and sincere feeling in my heart and mind and that I might clearly project that. I pray that you would bless them as well, these, these uh, people that I have gathered here tonight that uh, they might derive encouragement from the things that I will be sharing, that we all might build in terms of our biblical knowledge and uh, the wonderful examples of the godly men and women of the past. Thank you so much for your precious word and all that it means to us. And I pray all of these things in Christ's name, amen. So uh, a few words, very few words about intentions. If you're hoping uh, to have an in-depth study of the prophets, I'm going to disappoint you uh, because we just don't have the time to cover the 12 prophets, the minor prophets, in uh, the quarter, even though it's longer than your average quarter, so to speak. So my goal for this series of studies after today, this introductory lesson, which is largely contextual, is to give you a broad overview. I want to introduce each prophet, share with you as much as we know, and frankly, we know very little about most of them. And uh, then I want to emphasize essential structure, the basic message that they were called by God to deliver, and the audience to whom it would be delivered. And uh, that's the core of it. So for a time-challenged person, that's what I call myself, and my wife emphatically agrees, I think this is really good because I will supplement with some uh, really definitive examples uh, in the text. This is not an exegetical study. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be doing that. Again, I don't have the time to do that. But uh, I do want to share with you as best as I can these elements and then some of the uh, definitive examples of, of the words of the prophets, which are often lyrical, very beautiful, powerful, filled with the wrath of God, but also God's hope and promise for his people. And uh, then the other thing I want to do uh, is some practical application. This is ancient material. We all know this. We're talking roughly of a period that's almost 400 years of time before Christ. But as with anything in Scripture, it's given to us to learn from, and we can make many wonderful practical applications in all of the minor prophets as we're going along. So that's basically what I want to do. And now I want to make a disclaimer. I don't know how you people feel about disclaimers, I always feel a bit awkward when I hear a public speaker make a disclaimer because automatically I think, oh, take him down a notch. He's, he's apologizing for something. But disclaimers are necessary at times. I'm following on the heels of Nathan Guy. And Nathan is a true biblical scholar. You know that as we've gone through Mark. I've been, as I'm sure most, if not all of you, very impressed with the depth of his knowledge, his perception, and his ability to articulate things. For me, a great speaker is someone who can take complex ideas and deliver them in a simple, easy to understand way. C.S. Lewis was a genius with that. I, don't, I can't think of anybody equal to him, but Nathan is certainly up there. So here's my disclaimer. I am not a biblical scholar, capital B, capital S. I teach art history. One of my teachers basically said, and this is not complimentary, that I was a glorified art appreciation teacher. 
not good, not good. So I don't, I have a fear of false pretension. I don't want anybody to leave here tonight thinking, well, Choate knows this stuff in the Bible. I'm not a biblical scholar. However, I am a biblical scholar. What does that mean? Notice the caps. So, a biblical scholar is a student of biblical languages, Hebrew, Greek, so forth, a scholar of theology, biblical history, exegesis. That's not what I am. I didn't attend seminary. I've not gone to any school of theology. I read commentaries and most importantly, the Bible. But I am a biblical scholar, little b, little s. And as I've noted here, this is one who studies the Bible, the better to understand God's will for us in this life. In that sense, we all are biblical scholars. And if we aren't, we should be. So the verses I reference here uh, are important to that end. But the most important one is Acts 17, verse 11. We all know this. Luke is talking about the people of Berea. He says in high praise of them, these were more fair-minded. In the text, this phrase fair-minded means literally noble, of a higher set of thought and intention. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So what made them noble? What made them noble is that they received the word readily. They were open. But more than that, they didn't depend upon the word of others. They looked into these matters for themselves. And brethren, that is one of the most important things of the Christian walk. If you are not a biblical scholar, little b, little s, scholar just is a highfalutin word for student, then you need to be. And it doesn't matter how young or old you are, you need to be because you need to be in the group of the Bereans. Okay, another thing. I've mentioned commentaries. I have the interpreter's commentary. I've got the Kaufman commentaries. I've got other sources that I use. I'm not quite as harsh on commentators as Nathan was. I think they're doing more than just filling empty time. But in any case, I do use commentaries, and I will be using Jack Lewis's The Minor Prophets. So I've already given grandson over here a heads up about this. I really appreciate his grandfather's book and uh, would recommend it to any of you. It uh, is going to be a textual backbone for a lot of the things that I share with you. And uh, I am something of a scholar, capital S, in art history, in spite of what my former teacher said of me. And I do honor the scholarly mechanics and uh, really the need to document your use of those uh, mechanics. And so this is why I'm giving a nod to Dr. Lewis, because he's the real biblical scholar here. And I'm just going to be sharing with you something of his study. So uh, again, uh, scholarship, whether you capitalize it or use a little s, words are important and uh, they need to be defined. I don't think we really need to define this one because I think we all know basically what this is about, but I love words and I'm gonna indulge myself for a few moments. Uh, but I think this will be of interest to you as well. So our English word prophet comes from the English, the Middle English, profiti, from late uh, Latin, profita, from Greek prophetes. So as I've put it up here, this is equivalent to pro, before, and fiti, speaker. So even in that simple breaking the word down, we get something of the fact that a prophet is one who is speaking before times. They are uh, really empowered by God to know something that none of the rest of us can know because they're speaking before time. Well, uh, actually in the Hebrew, and again, uh, I'm dependent upon other people for these things, but in the Hebrew, there are three words 
pardon me as I do this kind of thing. Dutch, I don't have your courage in standing way up there. Uh, it would be more convenient. But in the Hebrew, there are three words. I, I don't know that anybody can even read that, but bear with me. I'm, again, working these things out. So there are three words, Nabi, Roe, and Hosa. And I don't know if I pronounced them correctly or not. Nabi literally means to bubble up. I thought that was interesting. Something that bubbles up in their spirit. Something that stirs them. I'm always reminded here of Jeremiah, who carried the burden of God's word and said, I couldn't be quiet. It was like a fire in my bones. What vivid word imagery that is. But uh, that word, nabi, is the one most often used in the Hebrew. Roe means to see or perceive. It is generally used to describe one who is a revealer of secrets, one who envisions. Hose also means to see or perceive, but it may also be used to be referred to a musician, a counselor, or an advisor. So uh, of these three, no, that's impossible to read. Can anybody read that? No. For about 1.5 seconds, I toyed with the idea of urging everybody to sit up there. And then I thought, no, nobody likes that. Nobody wants that. Okay, well, I'll have to make bigger fonts, big, bigger type. But anyway, Nabi is the one most often used. So uh, a prophet, of course, everybody can see that. A prophet is one who speaks for God or by divine inspiration. Again, we already knew this, but I thought some of those elements in word study uh, were of interest. What about this? Eh, I think you can make that out. So uh, I make no bones about it. This comes right out of Jeff's grandfather's book, right out. I thought it was wonderful information. So I want to share some basic principles with you about the minor prophets, a la Jack Lewis. And uh, these verses, I'm not going to take the time to reference them. Again, I took this right out of Dr. Lewis's book. You might want to jot them down or not. That's entirely up to you. I keep forgetting. I do have some handouts. <sighs> okay, I'm still feeling it. I'm still good. Just a bit awkward. Remember, I've just come into my own, just now. So uh, Eric has some handouts, and uh, there are only 40 of them, because the last time I taught here, I made so many handouts that, honestly, I could paper an entire room of my house with the leftovers, and I didn't want to do that again. So uh, you can raise your hand, or uh, he'll distribute as we're going along. And this is a one-time deal. I'm not planning on doing this again. So the basic principles. Dr. Lewis says, the prophet is a man who is moved by the Holy Spirit. The prophet cannot introduce strange religions. Prophets did not introduce a new law. It was their function to call man back to the law given by Moses. Moreover, the true prophet is the man whose oracles come to pass. However, the prophet knows only those things that God has revealed to him. The ability to know the future belongs to God only. And we see this in various places, not only through the minor prophets, but throughout other prophetic texts. And then as part of that, uh, prophecy is conditional. So just because a prophet says this is going to happen, if there is a time element involved and part of that prophetic message is calling the people to repent and they repent, God's not going to make it happen. The best example of that, I was surprised that uh, Dr. Lewis didn't cite this, but I will, is the entire book of Jonah. I mean, that's a great example of what we're talking about. Jonah was called to foretell doom on Nineveh. But Nineveh repented, and so that prophecy did not occur. And then finally, the minor prophets are so called, not because their messages are of minor significance or importance, but simply because their books are the briefest, 
briefest of the Bible's prophetic texts. And I really want to emphasize that one because I don't know about you, but when I hear minor prophets, <laughs> I can't help but have this image of these little men running around with their Bedouin hats on. And we got to wipe that out of our mind. These are great men of faith who tower by virtue of their integrity and the fact that they are inspired by God. They tower over the people of their day. They're God's tools and messengers, and they're, they're sharing some weighty material, often to their own very serious cost. Okay, well, some essential structure that is true really for all of the minor prophets, and uh, you're, we're going to see this over and over again, because I've told you one of the things I'm going to try to do as we go through the 12 minor prophets is share basic Things, essential structure, the basic message, what are they saying, who are they saying it to, and uh, something of the outcome of that as best as we know it and understand it through history and archaeology. Uh, and Dutch, I'm going to step on your toes here a bit, but hey, you know, I've been doing this a long time too. <laughs> it's not exactly uniquely yours. He knows I say these things in love. I, I love his classes. So, some essential structure. First of all, the prophet almost always has a strong denunciation of wrongdoing. And then that is followed by oracles of punishment. And then usually there is something positive, oracles of hope. Some remnant will be saved. There will be some future for the faithful. And... Uh, in my own notes uh, relevant to all of this, I've made it even simpler than this because so often the oracles of wrongdoing in this period of Old Testament time has to do with idolatry. It's rampant throughout the divided kingdom. And in consequence of that, really, this is the simplistic view. Dr. Lewis probably wouldn't approve of it, Jeff, but here it is. Idolatry, punishment, salvation. So I don't want to be simplistic, but again, that's the simple structure. There is really a denunciation of wrongdoing. Quite often it is idolatry, as we'll see over and over again. And then that's followed by a threat of what's going to happen or what will happen because the time for repentance has passed. And then usually there's some salvific statement, some statement of hope for, again, a righteous few. Okay, so what Eric is passing out, and I probably should have picked out two people to help, but uh, anyway. Oh, you made more copies, my word. Maybe my room in my house won't have to be wallpapered. But anyway, this is really basic. Uh, I thought about working out Wednesday night by Wednesday night, the structure. But honestly, I'm still working on all of this. And so it was hard to decide, well, Hosea is going to need at least two nights or whatever. My real fear was Jonah. I love Jonah. Jonah is one of the most impressive texts of the Bible. I've preached from it. I've taught lessons from it. And it's not just the strange fish story thing. It's just the power of the message, the power of the effectiveness of Jonah's very short sermon, and the mercy that God shows to the evil city of Nineveh because they repent. There's so many wonderful lessons about Jonah. Uh, but I'm going with what I understand best to be the chronological order of the minor prophets, not their order in our Bibles. I want to try to do this in the order in which the messages were delivered. And as I understand it, citing Dr. Lewis and other sources, Jonah is probably the first of these minor prophets. And uh, so anyway, I got off what I was trying to say. I've not given you any dates here because, as I've said, I'm making all of this up still, working on all of this. And I also wanted to leave myself the freedom that if I got off and I talked too long about Jonah, and I'm really likely to do that, or whatever, then I'm not tied to anything and nobody's going to hiss and boo me when I get up the next time. But uh, in any case, this gives you some kind of a sense of, uh, of the order in which we're going to be dealing with these. 
And uh, then the other bit on that handout is just the really important chronology, including the life dates that I'm using that allows for this structure. So uh, you might want to hold on to that handout because uh, it provides some undergirding foundation for the entire series of lessons for this, for this uh, extended quarter. Okay, so chronology. And uh, I have been wondering what the contrast of light would be like and what would be visible and what wouldn't. Don't worry, when I use maps, I'm gonna have big red triangles that point out this or that place, and I'll try to make things as big as I can. But I am gonna be providing maps with you because as well as being time challenged in delivery, I'm also geographically challenged. If I don't know where I am in teaching art history or in teaching the Bible, I'm sort of at sea here, and so I, I'm going to be sharing with you various maps. This is the broadest one that shows what is often referred to as the Fertile Crescent, which stretches from the Tigris-Euphrates River. Uh, in ancient times, this is Mesopotamia, literally the land between the two rivers. Today, this is Iraq. And then it uh, sort of curves over and goes down the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean, and that's the ancient uh, nation of Israel, modern nation of Israel and Palestine. Uh, often this is referred to as the Levant, the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean. Actually, this should curve down into Egypt as well because Egypt was very much a part of the Fertile Crescent. In Roman times, the Egyptian grain provided uh, the proletariat of Rome with their food, literally. This was the breadbasket of the ancient world. So this is the big map that shows pretty much everything of interest for us. Here's a more specific map that shows us the modern nation names. Ancient Mesopotamia, as I've said, is Iraq. Ancient Persia is today Iran. And uh, you see Saudi Arabia and Syria and so forth. I think I am going to turn down the lights the next time so we have a little bit more contrast. And then this is a Google map that I, you know, I found that uh, I thought would be helpful. All right, wow, somebody's doing it. Yeah, I think that's better. A Google map that uh, gives you a sense of uh, the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And uh, I will be using that. In fact, I'm gonna use it right now. So here are some of my big red triangles. So the capital, of Jeruz uh, the capital of Judah, the southern kingdom, is, of course, Jerusalem. And that of the northern kingdom, Israel, is Samaria. And uh, Brother Dutch, what's the, diff the distance between these two, roughly? Yeah, I was going to guesstimate, but I didn't want to do that. about 40 miles. This is an amazingly small postage stamp of real estate, and yet so many tremendous historical events have occurred in this uh, place. Okay, so, uh, wow, stone and iron and uh, fire, actually, aren't just amazing moving pictures. I think that's really, it's like a ride at Disney World. <laughs> Well, I think so. Anyway, uh, I, before we got into anything else, uh, time, chronology, cultural context is important as well. And I want you to try to think about really the ancient world. And I don't really think any of us can because we don't live in that time. And I read a lot of history and uh, art history, and I spend a lot of time thinking about the past, but I don't think I can really appreciate how hard life was in the ancient world. So for just a few moments, I wanna share with you some things about the ancient world that uh, hopefully will help us put a lot of this in better context. 35 miles. All right, there you go. 
with, uh, with uh, smartphones, it's amazing. I've often looked up something right before class began to maintain that illusion that I knew. You do that. <laughs> you do that. See, I've been lamely trying to be funny. And here's a man who really does it. I, I rarely make jokes in class because nobody laughs. And it's painful and rather pathetic when you're the only one who laughs. I actually thought I would make up some placards that would say, laugh. And then I would flip it over and say, okay, but it was funny anyway. I actually printed out that text, but I haven't mounted it yet on foam core. You think I'm joking, I'm not. But he can make people laugh. Okay, well, forget the laughter because I really am putting on my serious face now. I, I want to be really serious because this is a time that I think we can't begin to understand or appreciate how hard life was. The great English historian Hobbes said that uh, in the ancient world, life was vicious, brutal, and short. I think that's the way that, that quote goes. And in a pithy phrase, that about sums it up. So first of all, Think about these things, whether you can read it or not. Political power and justice were largely dependent upon one man's will, the king's. With few exceptions, there were no systematic codes of law. The Code of Hammurabi is one of those exceptions. I think it dates back to the 17th century BC. It's the earliest law code that's come down to us. But just think about that. Here in America, we pride ourselves in being governed by law. No one is supposed to be above the law. Just imagine living in a society where the fiat, the word of the king, that was it. In many cases, there was no recourse. If you sought justice, it was dispensed, and it may or may not be justice in the true sense of that word. Petty kingdoms operated on the premise of might makes right. When defeated, an enemy must expect no quarter. So when I say petty, I really mean petty. Do you remember in Genesis where Abraham finds that uh, the kings of the area of Sodom and Gomorrah have raided and they've carried off a lot of wealth, including uh, his nephew, Sod uh, Lot, and his whole family? And uh, yet Abraham is such a man of power and wealth that from his own following, he raised an army and defeated this coalition of kings. So we're not talking about kings in the sense of the medieval world where we're talking about people who ruled over thousands and hundreds of thousands. We're talking basically about the rulers of city-states who may have had a few hundred men at their direction. But even so, uh, this made for a very fragmented kind of situation. And frankly, anyone who was outside of your group, your city-state, your clan, tribe, family, that person was the other. And depending on how we looked at this, that person was a potential enemy. Uh, if you could kill them, your chances of life were all the better because you could take whatever you wanted from their stuff and uh, it was then yours. So uh, this is why when armies met in battle in the ancient world and one army defeated another, it was very common for the defeated enemy to be slain on the field. We're talking about throats slit, people being butchered by hundreds if not thousands, such that when the Romans rose to prominence in the ancient world, they actually thought they were a merciful, humane people because they didn't do that. They sold their defeated enemies into slavery, and some of them they trained to be gladiators to fight to the death, if need be, on the sands of the arena of Roman amphitheaters. But they could also, if they were successful in their trade, win their freedom. It's a strange world we live in because the Romans on that basis thought themselves to be humane, civilized because they didn't just butcher their enemy on the field. That was the more common practice. Ironically, though, once hospitality is extended to someone, they are sacred in your home. 
This is why, uh, really, in Judges 19, the Levite who stops at Bethuel in the home of the old man, the, that host is willing to send his daughter out to those perverse men who want to know the Levite. This is why in Sodom and Gomorrah the same thing happens, and Lot offers to send out his own daughters, which I cannot imagine. But so sacred was hospitality that he would send his own daughters out rather than these three men, as he thought they were, in reality, the angels of the Lord. Well, I guess it was two, actually. In any case, think about this. No police, no firefighters, no social services, no humanitarian aid. There was no Red Cross in the ancient world. If there was a devastating fire, a calamity of some sort, a famine, a drought, a flood, you were on your own. Good luck with that. And uh, let me back up a little bit and say that most people with this kind of scenario in endemic warfare, it would be a, a rare person who didn't go through an attack upon their city, their home, their encampment, whatever it might be. It probably was extremely rare. Most people in a given lifespan would probably have to go through the fear, the danger, the very real possibility of, of violent death, uh, at least once in their life. And uh, we just, it's hard to imagine that now today. But that's not all. Women and children were at best extensions of the husband and father. This was a very patriarchal world we're talking about. Uh, at worst, they were chattels, they were possessions, and were used accordingly. Child exposure was very common if the child was unwanted, particularly if it was female. We talk about this being common in Rome, the Roman world, as indeed it was. It wasn't restricted to Rome. Slavery, of course, was common. There was no question about the morality of it. It just was. And you just accepted it and lived with it. Nobody questioned it, or very few. And then, of course, religion. Idolatry abounded. Every people, every region had its own gods. And these were often gods that demanded bloody sacrifices. We're not just talking about goats and uh, oxen, bullocks, cattle, chickens, pigs. We're also talking about human beings. One of the most prominent of the uh, Canaanite gods was Moloch. And uh, often children were offered to him. They were literally burned alive in order to prevent the kind of things that I'm talking about, uh, a siege or uh, really a terrible time of famine or drought. Well, uh, again, these are, I think, weighty matters. Well, other things that are important for the context of the Minor Prophets, the divided kingdom. So we know that in 1 Kings 12, we have the story of the foolishness of Rehoboam, the son and successor of Solomon, who goes against the wise counsel of the older advisors and decides to strengthen the taxation and heighten the despotic rule that uh, he was told his father was guilty of. And in consequence, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. And so Israel during this period is not a unified kingdom, but this is the northern kingdom. So uh, this was established by Jeroboam, who even in Solomon's time uh, turned renegade and had to flee from the court of Solomon to prevent being taken in charge. And uh, so he became the first king, and uh, he established terrible precedents. He realized that if his people in the northern kingdom, the capital being Samaria, travel that 35 some odd miles down south to worship by God's direction in Jerusalem, then uh, he felt that in time there would be no northern kingdom. There would just be, again, the unified kingdom. Nothing ties people more together than common faith. 
And uh, so he decided to make golden calves. And he erected them in different points in uh, the kingdom of Israel. And these became not only a common problem, but set an example for all of the succeeding kings of the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom consisted of the bulk of the people of Israel, some 10 tribes. The only two that were excluded were Benjamin and Judah. I've already told you that the capital was Samaria. During the 208 year period in which we have the northern kingdom, there was not a single godly king. They were all idolaters, rascals, villains, bloodthirsty despots. So in consequence of this, uh, really the first of our prophets are speaking against the uh, really terrible practices of the northern kingdom. And in consequence, around 722, 721 BC, God uses a bloodthirsty people to the north, northern part of Mesopotamia, the Assyrians, who take them into exile, never to return. They're gone forever. Judah, on the other hand, uh, is known as the southern kingdom. And it's considered to be the heir to the united kingdom of David and Solomon. It consists solely of Benjamin and Judah, but in spite of the fact that the great city Jerusalem is its capital, it's largely rural. During their, this period, we're told there were about five godly kings. That's not a good percentage either, but at least it's doing better than Israel. They too are given warnings, prophecies, uh, of things that will happen if they do not truly repent. Among these five godly is Hezekiah. Hezekiah institutes reforms to try to get the people back on track, but these do not prove to be long-lasting. So they are conquered by another tool of God, the Neo-Babylonians. They come from the southern part of Mesopotamia. Their great capital, of course, is Babylon. About 586 BC, the southern kingdom is taken, the majority of them, and uh, taken to Babylon and the surrounding area. But they are allowed to return to the promised land uh, by the reign of the Persian emperors, beginning as early as about 536 BC. And that's what Brother Dutch is going into and the class on Sunday. So this is the divided kingdom in essence. And uh, now I want to share with you a little bit about the negative tools that God uses, the Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians. And uh, no, we didn't finish in 15 or 20 minutes, but I'm going to try to wrap it up uh, in the next 10 so the Assyrians, actually, they're, the Assyrians are an ancient people. They go all the way back to the second millennium BC. But for our purposes, the important phase in history and art history is referred to as the Neo-Assyrian culture, which rises in power in northern Mesopotamia around 1900 BC. They take their name from their principal god, which I've gotten off. Somebody should have waved or something. It's your fault, not mine. <laughs> Hold on that stuff for a moment, because this is the Minor Prophets chronology. Eric, I gave you all of my handouts. <laughs> I think I'll, for the sake of time, I think I'll just squint a lot during this next few moments. So, Assyrian Empire. Uh, here is the chronology that I'm using for Jonah. Uh, Amos, Hosea, Micah, these all prophesy before 722 BC. Obviously, their main focus is upon the, the things that are going on, not only in Israel, but in the surrounding nations. And then we have the conquest of Israel by the Assyrians, as I've said, 722, 721 BC. And then we have Zephaniah and Nahum prophesying in this interim period. If you can see it, either on your handout or on the PowerPoint, FL means flourishing. We don't know exactly when these men lived. This is a scholar's guess based upon the textual clues that are in the books. So flourishing means they're, at their, somewhere in this period, they're alive and working. So Habakkuk and Obadiah prophesy 
uh, as we note the rise of the Neo-Babylonians who overthrow the Assyrians and occupy the vacuum of power that they formerly occupied. About 586 BC, Judah is taken into exile by uh, the Babylonians. And uh, as I've already mentioned, about 536 BC, the Persians allow the, uh, the exiled uh, people of Judah in Babylon and the surrounding area to return home. And so we have uh, the walls and so forth rebuilt. And then we have after this, Zechariah, Haggai, Joel, and Malachi. Of course, these are only the minor prophets. As we're going along, I'm gonna to try to point out when Isaiah and Jeremiah and other major prophets are uh, living and working as well at the same time. Okay, now, here is the map. This is the territory occupied by the Assyrians, the northern part of Mesopotamia. We have Nineveh, everybody knows that from the book of Jonah. We also have, on this map, it's marked as Korsabad, but uh, it's also known as Der Shurukin, the city of Sargon II. He was one of the principal Assyrian uh, kings who took the people into exile and then built this great fortress citadel uh, north of Nineveh, which is often thought of as the true capital of the Assyrian power. And we also have Ashur, named after the principal deity of the Assyrians, but also the name of a city. And then Nimrod, these are all major Assyrian capitals with Nineveh uh, being probably the most important. What you're looking there uh, on the upper left is a Lamassu. This is a combination of a lion, an eagle, and a man, sometimes a bull, an eagle, and a man. They're awe-inspiring symbols of power, spiritual strength and power. And then here we have the Shurush, which is a strange kind of reptilian dragon-like creature. It is the animal counterpart to the Babylonian sun god Marduk. And uh, this detail comes from the Ishtar Gate, originally part of Babylon's infrastructure. So this is a symbol not only of ancient Babylon, but the Neo-Babylonians in particular. Here is their most important area, the southernmost region of Mesopotamia. And of course, Babylon is the capital. When the Assyrians fall, then the Babylonians pretty much occupy all of the territory that had been conquered and held by the Assyrians. These are two of the first great empires of the world. So as I was saying about the Assyrians, they rise in power during this period. They are conquered by an alliance of their enemies, the Babylonians, the Medes, about 625, 612 BC. They were hated and feared for their conquests and their cruelty throughout the ancient world. They reached their height of expansion by the early seventh century. They had conquered not only all of Mesopotamia, the territory off to the east, Syria, I'm sorry, off to the west. They had also made, as we've seen, inroads down south through Israel, took the uh, kingdom, northern kingdom into exile into Egypt. So they stretched uh, from the south to Egypt all the way to uh, Assyria and uh, Persia in uh, the east. Now, these people reveled in their cruelty. Again, they were universally hated and feared in the ancient world. Here's a translated inscription from the walls of the palace of Asher, Nasserpal, who ruled in the uh, early eighth, uh, ninth century BC. I built a pillar against a city gate. I flayed or skinned alive all of their chiefs who had revolted. I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar, some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes, others I bound to stakes about the pillar. I made one pillar of the living and another of heads, and I bound their heads to tree trunks around the city. Their young men and maidens I burned in the fire. These are people that not only do horrible, terrible, perverse things, but they're proud of it. They boast of it. And this is one sample of many that have been recovered. Here's another sample. 
Shalmaneser III, who ruled in the mid to the later part of the 9th century BC, waged war for 31 years of his 35-year reign. He crowed in the writings that have come down to us about him, I destroyed, I devastated, I burned with fire, 250 cities I destroyed, awe-inspiring terror I poured out. Can you imagine living in a world like this? These people had to. The Neo-Babylonians, the Babylonians were conquered by the Assyrians about 710 BC, but they successfully revolted against them. And with their allies, the Medes, they overthrew the Assyrians about 612 BC. As I've said, they more or less occupied the same territory. They too were a great world power. It's been estimated that Babylon was the largest city in the world about 1770 to 1670 BC. In the old Babylonian period, that's the time of Hammurabi and his law code, if you know that. And then again, during this new or neo-Babylonian period, the great ruler here, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar of the Book of Daniel fame. And so this phase of Babylonian power lasted from 612 until ultimately about 320, uh, because this becomes an important place for the Persians as well. Uh, who succeeded the Babylonians. But for the Neo-Babylonians per se, this is only about 76 period, uh, 76 year period. So during that period, Babylon is thought to have been a very large city, uh, reaching as much as about 200,000. Not only was it populous, but it was wealthy. It was the home of the famous Hanging Gardens, one of the legendary seven wonders of the ancient world, a center of ancient scholarship, Again, very wealthy, very rich in cultural development. In addition to the Surush and the Lamassu, these peoples took the lion as a symbol of their pride. In fact, here's a lion from Assyria, from one of the Assyrian sites. The lion was sort of a state symbol for the kings of Assyria. It was thought to be even then the king of beasts, and it was the uh, really... Uh, quality of fighting the lions that marked a great king. They did this for sport. We have many images of lions being killed, butchered by Assyrians. The Babylonians, too, took the lion as a symbol of great power. But uh, we're out of time, so let me conclude with just one more thought. These lions, of course, are made of stone and tile. They may be fearsome symbols, but that's all they are. The minor prophets talk about another lion, and that's represented here by an image of the real thing. The lion roars. Who is this lion? Is this Judah? This is often associated with the kingdom of Judah. No, this is God. In fact, that very word picture will be used in some of the prophets. God is a lion. He roars. He's the real thing to fear. And he uses these wicked people as his tools to punish his own people. So that's it for tonight. I will make an assignment. I'm a teacher. If you haven't visited Jonah recently, read Jonah. And we're going to be focused on that next time. Well, uh, really quickly, let me say a brief word of prayer and then we'll be done. Thank you, Father, for this time that we've had together tonight. I pray that you would bless us as we go forward for the rest of the week. Help us to keep in our hearts and minds your word, its power, its promises, its strength. Help us to be the people individually and as families and collectively that you've called us to be, the salt and leaven of this world. Thank you again for your word, and thank you most of all for Christ. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Thank you.